All right, uh, good afternoon again. My name is Jeff Unger. I'm a, a family practitioner, a diabetologist, and a concierge medical group in uh, Southern California. Uh, over here to my right is Dr. Prattley. He's the Samuel Crockett Chair in Diabetes Research at the Florida Hospital Diabetes Institute right here in Orlando. I actually feel very sorry for him. He had to travel quite a distance to get here today. He said he was stuck in traffic for five minutes. I, on the other hand, flew from the West Coast. It took seven hours to get here. Sorry, Rich. Uh, this program uh, is accredited for one unit of CME, and uh, the uh, accreditation it is accredited by NCQA, and it's supported by Nova Nordisk uh, and uh, Merck. These are learning objectives. So we're going to describe the clinical and economic impact of suboptimal diabetes care. I think you'll see we need to do better with diabetes overall in the U.S. Uh, healthcare system. Uh, Rich is going to talk about uh, some of the latest uh, clinical trials that you might want to pay attention to because we have drugs, I believe, that will be very beneficial for many of those patients that are not under control. Rich is also going to tackle some of the guidelines and the uh, evidence-based uh, medicine theories that will help you uh, guide your patients to successful treatment. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, medical homes as well as uh, diabetes uh, 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 research protocols and um, registry programs. So we'll talk a little bit about that. All right, as you know, there's a lot of people with diabetes. The penetrance rate in the United States is about 10% of the population. It's growing rapidly. Over the last uh, 20 years, the prevalence of diabetes has essentially uh, quadrupled. And what really troubles me with this, Rich, is that we now have a very high percentage of adolescents that also have prediabetes or uh, diabetes type 2. And that's gone up threefold in the last uh, 10 years. The, bother, the, the trouble with this is that these people, these are young people, if they have diabetes now, they're likely to have cardiovascular events in their 20s. So it's something that we need to consider. We also have 92 million Americans that have prediabetes, but it's not as bad as China. In China, the estimations are half a billion, that's with a B, people with prediabetes. So there's a lot of diabetes going forward, and by the year 2030, about a third of the U.S. population is going to have this disease. It's very expensive as well. I mean, uh, if you put the cost of prediabetes in with diabetes, you're looking over $300 billion of money spent on taking care of these patients. That's about $1,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. It, may, it might be hard for you to understand $300 billion, but I'll tell you what this means personally. Last week, I went to Caesar's Palace, and this is how much I lost. However, I got even. I got even. I stole 600 sweet and lows. So it's very, very expensive uh, for our uh, country. And if we don't rein this in, then we're going to be in deep trouble moving forward. Uh, the interesting thing is that even though 62% uh, of people with diabetes are covered by government types insurance, the uh, recent reports from NHANES over the last three years shows that the number of patients that actually achieve their targeted A1C of 7% or less has declined 2% from the prior three-year reporting period. So that makes no sense. We've got drugs that Rich is going to talk about that will show you. And we can get people to go 74% of the time. Uh, we have excellent drugs. We have excellent people like you in the room that can drive this. But there's something missing. We're missing out here. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about adherence moving forward. And uh, that adherence issue plays a big role in medical homes. Uh, just for the record, California is the largest state with the largest uh, diabetes population. And it costs us about $27 uh, billion. And Florida is fourth most populous state, but second in terms of diabetes-related uh, uh, costs. <laughs> it's interesting. I represent California. Dr. Prattley represents Florida. You know, you go figure. <laughs> this is a, a slide that shows that over the last 20 years, the incidence of cardiovascular disease strokes has declined a little bit in people that do not have diabetes. However, if you look at the diabetes population, things are really much better. There's about 61% of the people with type 2 diabetes over the last 20 years that have actually improved their outcomes. The problem is, look at the difference between people with no diabetes and the people with diabetes. This is a very high problem, big problem. 
and this is driven by that glycemic burden. So one of the problems that we see now in primary care is that we recognize diabetes, but there's delay in treating. So there's a delay in starting insulin, there's a delay in starting GLP-1s, start, a delay in starting a lot of different things. And we need to do better with that. This is a slide uh, that shows, this is a study from Dr. Kunti, who's actually a family doctor. Uh, he's also an epidemiologist from uh, United Kingdom. He looked at over 100,000 patients charts in, uh, in England and basically found that if you have a patient newly diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, if you get the A1C less than 7% within two years of the diagnosis, you can reduce the likelihood of an event like an MI by 67%. If you do not get the uh, A1C in target within that two-year period of time, you develop this bad glycemic effect or uh, bad glycemic legacy. And this drives these diabetes-related complications. For those of us that have type 1 diabetes, there's actually some good news out there. This is from the Diabetes Control and Complications Study, which looked at uh, type 1 diabetes intensively and conventionally treated years ago, 1993. But the, the, the thing is that if you can get your A1C less than 8.1% and maintain it there, that's above the target, but that's what the study shows. If you can just get to 8.1%, you will outlive people with no diabetes. Good for us. The problem is reduction in mortality does not equate with reduction in risk factors for other complications, some of which Rich is going to talk about in just a few minutes. So we still have to do better than 8.1%. I've been talking a little bit about A1C, but uh, in medical homes and people that educate, for people that educate, we need to explain to our patients what an A1C is. I had a patient that came in just uh, the other day, been seeing the same doctor for six years, knows what her A1C is, but doesn't know what the meaning of that uh, A1C is. So diabetes is a very sticky disease. As the glucose levels go up, the sugar sticks to stuff. One of the things the sugar sticks to is hemoglobin. Once you stick to hemoglobin, I don't have a pliers that can't pull it off. Hemoglobin is recycled every three months. So the A1C gives us an average glucose level over a three-month period of time. Uh, and this relates to diabetes-related complications. Now, nobody really dies anymore of diabetes. They die of the complications. Complications include eye problems, kidney problems, nerve problems, heart attacks, and strokes. And you can see each one of these lines represents a complication. Uh, on the lower uh, axis, you have the average A1C that you want to achieve by your patient. On the left axis, what you have is the relative risk, meaning what's the likelihood of you getting a specific complication in relation to somebody that doesn't have diabetes. So our target for most people is 6.5 to 7. We have patients that you see that start off around 11%, and then you bring them down to 8. Does that mean you failed if they can't go any further? And the answer is no. You are intensifying therapy. It's tough to get these patients down to target. However, if you can reduce the A1C even 1%, there's a reduction in cardiovascular risk and microvascular resist, which is really statistically and clinically significant. Still, we've got patients that have other problems besides diabetes. So it's not just about the sugar. We've got lipids we have to worry about. We have blood pressure we have to worry about. If we don't fix these patients, then they're going to have a higher cardiovascular risk. But the problem is, even if you get the people under control with all these metabolic factors, there's still about 30% of the people that have an event. And this might be due to something called insulin resistance. So with insulin resistance, you have low levels of nitric oxide, which results in vasoconstriction. You have increased clotting due to something called PI-1, which is elevated. Uh, and you have vascular inflammation. So we, we have drugs that may potentially help that. Uh, and Rich is going to talk to you a little bit about reducing the risk in these patients with diabetes forthcoming. As you can see from this slide, people that, that have diabetes have a, a very significant increased risk of cardiovascular disease. It doesn't matter if it's stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, uh, MI, death from cardiovascular causes, and so forth. It's coming. But if we can treat these people aggressively and early, I think we have better outcomes to look forward to. Our target here for patients with diabetes, as I mentioned, is an A1C less than 7% in most people. However, 
Think about it this way. If you go to a nursing home, if you have a patient in a nursing home, they're 95 years old, and they're on five different therapies, including insulin, and they have an A1C of 5%, you might want to think about lowering it a little bit. Uh, maybe, in, I should say, increasing it maybe to 8, 8.5. Keep them safe, because what we don't want is hypoglycemia, and we don't want weight gain. So there could be some exceptions to this rule that need to be considered. Here are the targeted goals. It's not just about the sugar. We want fasting glucose levels down. We want postprandial glucose levels down. We want the A1C down, blood pressure down. Lipids should be well controlled. Most people less than uh, 100 on their LDL, but if they have cardiovascular risk, going down to 70 or low is probably a good idea. If you do, if you are successful in treating uh, the uh, lipids, the blood pressure, and the glucose levels, then you can have a significant reduction in these cardiovascular events. So with that having been said, I'll uh, reintroduce uh, Dr. Prattley, who's actually one of my mentors. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Well, people haven't welcomed you to Orlando already. Let me be the first. Uh, Orlando's a great place to live. I've been here for almost seven years. Uh, and there's a lot more to it than the convention center and the uh, attractions. Uh, and one of the things is our hospital. Uh, it's a picture of our cardiovascular tower on the left, uh, a uh, diabetes institute there on the second to the left, our clinical research unit in the middle, and then our um, basic biomedical research facility uh, near the airport. We have a 2,700-bed hospital. We have a clinically integrated network. We have um, uh, medical homes uh, that are integrated within that network. So we are also on the same journey of improving uh, quality in our system. Uh, but this is like turning the Titanic, if you can imagine an operation this uh, size. So we have plenty of opportunities to treat diabetes. There are now 12 classes of medications for lowering glucose levels for patients with type 1 diabetes. And they all work. One of the problems that we have, though, is how do you choose between these different classes? How do you uh, make the best choices for your patients in practice? So one way to approach this is to follow guidelines that the American Diabetes Association has and other organizations such as the endocrinologists. And most of these guidelines start with metformin therapy and then add on medications as diabetes control worsens, and it typically does in most patients. So we use metformin therapy because there's a long history of efficacy. We know that it works. It's quite safe for most people, and it's quite well tolerated, and it's cheap. When it comes to second-line therapy, though, we have lots of choices. In the ADA guidelines, there are six different choices, uh, some older choices, such as the sulfonylureas, TZDs, and then newer choices, such as the DPP-4 inhibitors, SGLT-2 inhibitors, GLP-1 receptor agonists, and even basal insulin. So how do you choose? What drugs do you choose for which patient at which time? And this is where a lot of the difficulty with the treatment of diabetes come. It's selecting the right patients for your, uh, like, right treatments for your patients uh, at the right time. In my clinic, this is a discussion. It's a discussion with a patient that involves their values, what they prefer, what they value, and uh, this allows us to uh, select the treatments that they're more likely to stay on. So our medications that we've had for uh, decades now, the uh, metformin, sulfonylureas, and the TZDs, they work through different mechanisms. They have different side effects. They all lower A1C uh, to about the same extent. Uh, and some of them have some advantages and disadvantages. Metformin, as I mentioned, is cheap. It has a low risk for uh, hypoglycemia. And we think that it probably decreases cardiovascular uh, events. The disadvantages principally are tolerability, gastrointestinal problems, and also problems with uh, diarrhea. Other side effects are pretty low, pretty rare uh, indeed. Sulfonylureas have as a side effect hypoglycemia, a little bit of weight gain, uh, and they're also fairly cheap. The thiazolidine dions have more side effects, things like uh, weight gain, edema, bone fractures, uh, and there's even risks about uh, bladder cancer that's in the label for one of the drugs, pioglitazone. That's proved to probably not be a real risk uh, in long-term studies. But these problems with the medications have led us to the development of these newer classes of medications over the last 10 to 15 years or so. Now, one big class of medications are incretin therapies. These leverage the beneficial effects of GLP-1 and GIP, which are hormones that the uh, 
gut produces in response to nutrients. So you're all producing GLP-1 and GIP as you eat. Uh, the incretin effects are diminished in patients with type 2 diabetes, so we're essentially trying to replace that metabolic uh, abnormality. These are valuable treatments because they target multiple metabolic abnormalities, don't cause hypoglycemia, and have favorable effects on weight. Two classes of drugs uh, in the incretin therapies. One is the DPP-4 inhibitors. These are drugs that block the enzyme that degrades GLP-1. These are oral agents. Uh, and then the other are GLP-1 analogs. These are peptides, and they're injectable therapy. So we're going to start with the DPP-4 inhibitors. We have four licensed in the United States, citagliptin, allogliptin, saxagliptin, and linagliptin. They're more similar than they are different. They are all potent DPP-4 inhibitors. They all last for most of 24 hours. And because of this mechanism action, they have a very similar efficacy. There's some differences in the dose. Uh, all of them except for linagliptin have to be adjusted in patients with chronic kidney disease but they're all really well tolerated. So they're a pretty similar class of medications. Here's the data on efficacy for this class of medications. This is DPP-4 inhibitors added to metformin across the different DPP-4 inhibitors. And you can see that by and large, the A1C reduction is on the order of 0.6 to 0.7% or so for each of these drugs. And that's, of course, because of the mechanism of action. Now, how do these drugs stack up against other medications that we use for diabetes, perhaps some of the older medications that we might use in combination with metformin? So there have been five trials now. There, here are four of them that have compared DPP-4 inhibitors to sulfonylureas, one of the older class of drugs. Now, sulfonylureas, we think, get off to a pretty good start, and they're pretty good drugs. But these four trials demonstrate that over at least a one- to two-year period, the A1C reduction with DPP-4 inhibitors is as good, if not better than, uh, the, deep, the sulfonylurea. And that's the bars in the middle uh, of the slide uh, here and uh, over here. But there are differences. With the sulfonylureas, there's a little bit of weight gain on the order of one uh, to one and a half kilograms, whereas in combination with metformin, the DPP-4 inhibitors are associated with some weight loss. And to me, the biggest difference is the risk for hypoglycemia. Look at the risk on the far right-hand uh, bars over there. Um, you can see that hypoglycemia occurred in 20 to 40 percent of patients treated with sulfonylureas versus uh, 5 to 6 percent or so in people treated with DPP-4 inhibitors. These are the hypoglycemic events that people report. There are actually many more uh, out there. And I think this is an important factor to consider because hypoglycemia leads to decreased adherence, uh, decreased patient uh, um, uh, compliance with medications, and uh, it's more likely to cause uh, severe side effects. Now, the DPP-4 inhibitors were developed during a time when there was concern about the cardiovascular side effects of drugs. So all of these drugs have done long-term cardiovascular outcome studies involving thousands of patients. And these, this slide presents data from three of these trials, the saxagliptin trial, the allogliptin trial, and the citagliptin trial. These range in size from about 4,000 patients to 14,000 patients, followed from anywhere from two years to about four years. The main finding from these studies was that there was no increased risk of cardiovascular disease with these drugs, but you can also see that there was no benefit to any of these drugs. They were completely neutral compared to standard uh, of care. So these trials were successful because they showed what they were intended to show, the safety of these drugs. But they didn't show that there was any benefit to these drugs. So the advantages and disadvantages of this class of medications, they enhance insulin secretion, they improve glucose control, as well as sulfonylureas. Uh, they're oral once daily. And I think the thing that sets these drugs apart is they are very well tolerated. Most people can take a DPP-4 inhibitor. They're weight neutral, and there's uh, apparent cardiovascular safety, but not benefit. Disadvantages are still a costly class of medication. They're not the most efficacious drugs that we have, to be frank. There's a pancreatitis warning. This is a rare event with these medications. There's a little lack of durability over time. And then with one of the medications, saxagliptin, there was a significantly increased risk of heart failure in the cardiovascular outcome study. I want to move on to the second class of medications, the GLP-1 analogs. These are injectable medications. They come in two flavors, those that are extendin-based and those that are human GLP-1-based. These come in pens for injection. These are rather like your insulin pens. You fit a small needle on the end. 
a couple of these uh, pens need to, uh, these devices, these drugs need to be reconstituted, but for the most part, they're just uh, injections. And uh, there's uh, one device that's an auto-injector. That uh, drug was dulaglutide. Now, these drugs have very different pharmacokinetics. Some are short-acting, lasting for two hours, and some are long-acting, lasting for a week to two weeks. And this has to do with their structure as well as the formulation. So these drugs have quite different treatment intervals, as you can imagine. And they also work in different ways. The short-acting drugs work primarily to decrease postprandial glucose levels, uh, whereas, sorry, I'm losing my mic here, whereas the long-acting drugs decrease both fasting and postprandial glucose levels. And that has implications for the efficacy of these drugs. Across different studies that have compared GLP-1 agonist in head-to-head -head studies, the short-acting GLP-1 uh, agonist, which is in the light yellow color here, uh, is almost always not as good as the long-acting GLP-1 agonist. And the reason for this is the long-acting one has a better effect on fasting glucose. It covers uh, glucose control throughout the day as opposed to just covering postprandial glucose. So the lead study compared liraglutide duration was the exenatide once weekly formulation. Uh, the duration six uh, was uh, another once weekly formulation versus liraglutide uh, of exenatide. The Harmony study was albiglutide. Award study was dulaglutide. And then the final study compared uh, dulaglutide versus liraglutide. And that study showed that uh, the once weekly and once daily were about the same in efficacy. How do these drugs stack up against the DPP-4 inhibitors? All of them have been compared to citagliptin, and in every single case, the GLP-1 agonist was better than uh, citagliptin at lowering A1C. There's some uh, similarity in terms of the hypoglycemia risk, but there was more weight loss with the GLP-1 receptor agonists, somewhere on the order of two to three and a half kilograms or so. So this is one of the other defining features of the GLP-1 receptor class, a little bit of weight loss. Um, and then, the, uh, as I mentioned, the rates of hypoglycemia were pretty similar between DPP-4 inhibitors and GLP-1 agonists, and that's because they're both working through a GLP-1 mechanism which is glucose-dependent. How do these drugs stack up against other injectables? So you have patients who are on a couple of oral medications, and you have a treatment decision. You can either put them on insulin, or you could put them on a GLP-1 receptor agonist. Now, we might think that insulin is the best treatment. You could get anybody to go if you gave them enough insulin. It turns out in these clinical trials where the investigators were given coaching on how to get people down to goal and the patients were contacted frequently, much more frequently than you would do in clinical practice, the GLP-1 receptor is at least as good, if not better in most cases, than basal insulin. And that's true for exenatide twice a day, liraglutide, exenatide once a week, uh, and even albiglutide was uh, equally efficacious at lowering uh, uh, A1C compared to once daily insulin uh, glargine. So that's kind of instructive because that means that we can uh, lower A1C with different treatment options uh, and then we can focus on some of the other features of these medications besides just the A1C lowering. One of the things that we could focus on is body weight change. With the GLP-1 receptor agonist, I mentioned you have some weight loss and you can see across these head-to-head -head trials ranged on the order from one and a half to as much as three and a half kilograms of body weight loss. Now, in a patient who's 100 kilograms, that doesn't sound like a lot of weight, but it does actually make a difference uh, to patients. They can sense the weight loss, and many people will have much more weight loss than average. And it also makes a, uh, a difference for overall uh, metabolic uh, status. Now, these drugs also had to do cardiovascular outcome studies uh, during the course of the development. Jeff already mentioned the LEADER study. This was a study which I was uh, involved in uh, from the global perspective. And this trial demonstrated that liraglutide, a once-daily GLP-1 agonist, was associated with a significant 13% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events. That's on the left-hand side. It was also associated with a 22% reduction in cardiovascular death in the middle, as well as a significant reduction in death from any cause. That was principally driven by the cardiovascular uh, reduction. So the question is, is this unique to 
uh, liragotide, or are there other GLP-1 agonists that share this same benefit? And uh, that was answered uh, in a paper that was published in the New England Journal in 2016 using a new drug called semaglutide. Semaglutide is not yet approved, but the FDA uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, issued a 16 to 0 um, favor, uh, opinion in favor of approving semaglutide. So likely it will be approved uh, before the end of the year. In the SUSTAIN-6 study, which was a smaller study of outcomes in patients treated with semaglutide, uh, semaglutide reduced major adverse cardiovascular events by 26%. That was highly significant and amazing given the short duration of the study. It also decreased stroke by 39%, which is also a very large reduction. And it decreased death from, it did not decrease death from cardiovascular causes. And the reason for that was probably because this was a short-term study. Now, the other GLP-1 agonists have also had outcome trials. The Elixir study, which is lixacenatride, did not show a benefit. Didn't show any increased risk, but this curve kind of looked like the DPP-4 studies. So it was safe, but it did not improve cardiovascular outcomes. And most recently, we've seen the results of the Excel study. This study used exenatide once weekly in patients with a cardiovascular risk. And what it demonstrated was there was a small decrease in MACE, 9%, that was just below statistical significance. The p-value was 0.06. They almost made it. There was uh, decreases in death from any cause, but because the primary endpoint wasn't significant, you can't call this uh, significant as well. So it looks like there's a little bit of a mixed picture in the GLP-1 receptor class in terms of cardiovascular benefit. Now, in fact, some of this can be related to the nature of the trials and the population study. I think in general what we're seeing is at least cardiovascular safety, and for at least some drugs, a cardiovascular benefit. So the advantages of the GLP-1 receptors are they lower glucose in a glucose-dependent fashion uh, through enhancing insulin secretion. Low risk of hypoglycemia. They work very quickly. And they have better efficacy than any other medication that we have for treating diabetes, including insulin. They're associated with some weight loss, and there's at least CVD safety and some benefit. The disadvantages are cost. These are the most expensive drugs if you look on uh, a per-dose uh, basis. Maybe not if people are on high dose of uh, insulin that's uh, using the analog insulins. It's an injection therapy, so there's more coaching uh, to get patients on therapy. Nausea happens in a substantial number of patients, and this can be limiting uh, for adherence for patients. Like the DPP-4 inhibitors, there's also a warning about pancreatitis. And then there's a warning about a rare cancer called medullary thyroid cancer that does not occur in humans. It happens in rodents, so don't treat your rodents with this drug. Last class of medications I want to review is the SGLT2 inhibitors. These work specifically in the kidney uh, to decrease glucose absorption uh, from the proximal tubules. So essentially what you're doing is peeing out excess glucose. This has secondary effects, improving insulin sensitivity uh, in the liver, in the muscle, uh, and improving beta cell function. There are three of these drugs that are now approved, canagliflozin, dapagliflozin, and empagliflozin. These are all oral medications. They're all taken once daily, uh, usually in the morning. How do these stack up compared to our other drugs? And the answer is they're slightly better than the DPP-4 inhibitors. They've been compared to citagliptin uh, as the GLP-1 agonists were. And there, the A1C difference was not quite as dramatic, but it was, in one, at least one case, significantly better. They have a weight advantage. Uh, so they're decreasing body weight by 2.5 to sometimes as much as 4.5 kilograms. Uh, so it's more than with the DPP-4 inhibitors. They have a low risk of hypoglycemia, comparable to a DPP-4 inhibitor. So overall, a very nice profile, uh, very well-tolerated drugs. These drugs have also undergone cardiovascular outcome assessments. The EMPA-REG outcome study used empagliflozin, and in this particular study, there was a quite rapid improvement in three-point MACE. There's a 14% reduction with empagliflozin-treated patients compared to usual care, there was also a very significant um, 38% reduction in cardiovascular death. This is unheard of. We don't get this kind of death reduction even with our statin drugs or blood pressure lowering. So this was phenomenal. This really turned the diabetes field on its head. Importantly, there was also a 35% reduction in heart failure. That's the bottom graph there. 
Heart failure is one of the major comorbidities of diabetes. This is what people often die of, uh, and it's one of the most common causes for hospitalization. So a 35% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure has significant implications for the cost of care for patients with diabetes. This may be a class effect. We see uh, similar results with canagliflozin. Uh, canagliflozin, uh, they did a study called CANVAS-R, and they saw exactly the same reduction in MACE events, uh, 14%. They didn't see a cardiovascular death benefit in the same way that uh, empagliflozin did, but there was the trend in the right direction, and they saw a 33% reduction in heart failure hospitalization. So we think that, uh, by and large, the benefits that we see with this class are probably a class effect. Finally, I want to talk a little bit about basal insulins because there's been a lot of activity uh, with that. We started with more concentrated insulins, insulin glargine, uh, degladec, uh, and then combinations with degladec, long-acting basal insulin. Uh, and then, more recently, we have the biologic insulin biosimilars uh, starting in 2016 and others appearing in 2017. And we've also seen some fixed-dose combinations with GLP-1 analogs. So the, these drugs have advantages over NPH. They're longer acting, so this is true once daily administration. They have less variability from day to day, a flatter biological profile, less hypoglycemia, and less weight gain, at least with insulin detimer. Here's a slide that indicates the uh, differences in variability uh, that ranges from uh, as much as 99% uh, with insulin glargine all the way down to 20% with insulin degladec. What this means is it's easier to titrate people to go without causing hypoglycemia. <coughs> we did a cardiovascular outcome study with insulin degladec, comparing it to insulin glargine, and saw there was a 9% reduction in major adverse cardiovascular events with degladec compared to glargine that was not significant. But importantly, there was much less hypoglycemia. Severe hypoglycemia was reduced by 40% with degladec and 53% with nocturnal severe hypoglycemia. So that's one of the large advantages for the, uh, more, uh, the newer uh, basal insulins. We should use basal insulins in patients, not necessarily everybody, but those who need a better basal insulin. Sometimes people who have nocturnal hypoglycemia, people who do shift work, uh, people who have a lot of variability in their blood glucose, and people with adherence issues. Now, when it comes time to intensify therapy, we have multiple choices. We can add a GLP-1 agonist. Uh, we can add rapid-acting insulin, or we could add mixed insulin. But there's some data on GLP-1 agonists in combination with basal insulin. In all cases, the significantly improved uh, efficacy, A1C efficacy lowering, uh, and that's true for both short-acting and long-acting GLP-1 analogs. And they did so with less weight gain. This has led to the formulation of fixed ratio uh, insulin GLP-1 combinations. There are two now that are available, insulin degladec and liraglutide, and insulin uh, glargine with lixicenotide. Both of these combinations work well to lower uh, A1C because they attack not only the fasting glucose levels with the basal insulin, but also the prandial glucose with the GLP-1. There's some mitigation of the weight gain with basal insulin with the combination and a low risk of hypoglycemia. There's also lower rates of nausea with the combination because you titrate these drugs slowly like you do with basal insulin. In the uh, IDEG-LIRA study, most of the patients got down to A1Cs in the 6 range. Uh, so they're remarkably effective. So when we think about selecting therapies, we have to uh, consider the starting A1C and where we want to get to, what our goal is. Potential effects on body weight, potential effects on hypoglycemia, and here, things like age and comorbidities are very important. We have to think about cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular risk factors. When we have patients with established cardiovascular disease, our current guidelines suggest selecting agents such as empagliflozin and liraglutide that now have indications for lowering cardiovascular risk. And then finally, patient factors. This is a conversation with our patients. Uh, it's pills versus injections. It's weight loss versus weight gain. It is cost versus uh, I've got good insurance. All these things are important considerations. So I'm going to close here, turn it back to Jeff, and then we'll have some time for questions at the end. Thank you. Thanks, Rich. <clears throat> Diabetes, I've got to tell you, is a very complicated disease. Let's say, God forbid, you get cancer. So you go to see the oncologist, and the oncologist says, okay, 
we got three choices. We could nuke it, we could cut it out, I got a big pill for you. Which one do you want? We well, think it over. And two weeks later, you go back and say, I want to nuke it. Fine, we'll nuke it, I'll see you back in six months. That's all there is. It's easy to have cancer. Diabetes is not so easy. Look at all the things you have to do. You got to exercise, you got to eat, you got to carb count, you got to figure out how much insulin you have to take for every meal. And there's always somebody behind you saying you're doing all wrong. It's your wife. I know this, okay? <clears throat> there's long work hours, not enough sleep, not enough food to be eaten, sometimes too much food to be eaten. There's a risk of hypoglycemia, there's a risk of weight gain. So it takes about two hours a day to get diabetes right. And Steve Edelman, who's a friend of myself and Dr. Prattley, who's a really, really good guy, he's type one diabetic himself, and he writes a lot of things. He said, you know, if you can keep your blood sugar in the target range of 80 to 180 for 24 hours, that's as difficult as throwing a no-hitter in baseball. Something to consider. <clears throat> now, what are our responsibilities, uh, responsibilities as clinicians, as doctors, uh, for these patients with diabetes? Well, first of all, we need to be coaches. The patient needs to be the captain. So as the coach of the team, we need to encourage the patient to do the absolute best that they can. We need to really define what the targets are. It's no good to just say you got an A1C of 8.1 without explaining what that 8.1 is and what it should be. We need to define fasting glucose levels as well as postprandial glucose levels. We absolutely must do our best to intensify therapy early in the course of the diagnosis, even with prediabetes. The sooner you treat it, the better it's going to be from a cost perspective, uh, from a matrix perspective, and from a complications perspective. We really want to preserve beta cells. Beta cells are our best friends. They produce insulin. Ralph DeFranzo suggested in something called the SAM study that by the time somebody's diagnosed as having diabetes, you've already lost 80% of your beta cell function. Not good. These are the cells that produce insulin. You want to use meds like Rich was talking about that make sense, not, for, not just from a cardiovascular standpoint, but they lower weight and they also lower the risk of hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia is a no-no if you have diabetes. You don't like it, it doesn't feel good, and it's expensive. We have to identify risk uh, patients, the high-risk patients for cardiovascular disease, and Rich explained some of the drugs that we could use to minim minimize that risk, and we need to consider putting those patients on. We have early referrals to CDEs and registered dietitians and medical homes. All this is easily done. And it needs to be done a lot more so we can improve our numbers. We also need to communicate. This is a big one. We need to communicate with our specialists. The worst specialists in the world are eye doctors. I mean, the patient will go see the eye doctor, and the, the, uh, you'll, you'll ask six months after the visit, oh, did you see the eye doctor? Uh, yeah. And what do the eye doctors say? Well, I got a little bleed in this eye. Not a big deal. I'm going to laser it. I'll see you back in a couple of months. Well, you never got any reports back from the eye doctor. So it's really good to get some communication going. And if you've ever seen a report from, from an ophthalmologist, it's illegible. It's got blots and, and dots everywhere. You don't know what the hell's going on. And if you call him, it's even worse. He can't understand what he's talking about. Okay. So you need to better communicate. Remember, diabetes is a discord. These patients have too much glucagon, which raises your blood sugar, and too little insulin. So as Rich mentioned, we have combination drugs now that can restore that imbalance. And never, ever give up hope. Never tell a patient, even that has multiple complications, that there's nothing else we can do for you. There's always something you can do. Sometimes we can't cure but we can provide hope and comfort for these patients. So this is a patient that was labeled as being non-compliant. His name is Henry. He's one of my patients on his first visit. Um, and Henry comes in. He's no dummy. He's got a master's degree in social work. He's a former, uh, 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 he's been in, the, in, he's part of the VA system. Uh, I think he served in Desert Storm. Diabetes for 17 years. A1C 9.1%. He's on 200 units of insulin a day, plus a load of other drugs. And he's been told that because of the A1C being so high, you're not doing it right. Get your act together. So he swears he's taking his meds. Let's hear from Henry and see who Henry blames. What worries you the most about having diabetes for 
16 years, 17 years. Well, what worries me the most is uh, what, how do I how do I deal with it? Everybody just says, take your medication, it'll be fine. Yeah. But what does that mean? Every time I ask somebody that I think should be able to provide an answer to me, they just say, well, your medication, just take your medication. But you're taking NPH 200 units a day. Yes, sir. You're going low. Yes. And you have no idea when to take it or, or what to expect from it, right? I do not. Who, who do you blame for this? Well, I, I, I that's a, well, that's a, uh, that's like a, I don't know who to blame, mm -hmm. except I would say that uh, the physicians and the nurses mm -hmm. have become so accustomed to giving a generic answer to that question that it becomes, well, just take your medication and you'll be fine. And, and you, in your old life, you used to be a deputy sheriff, and, and you also have a master's degree from USC, right? Yes, sir. Uh, and the master's degree is in what? Uh, social work. So he, he's a good guy, and it turns out it wasn't his fault. He had a, a diagnosis of hemochromatosis, which is an iron storage disease, and too much iron invaded his pancreas, and it wasn't working very well. So once we fix that, glucose levels improved. You can see here, this is a, a, a graph of something called a Libre Pro. Uh, this is a new sensor that's available. Patients put it on their arms, wear it for uh, 10 days. Uh, they, they don't have to do any blood sugar testing anymore. They just scan, scan, scan. This will be available uh, starting in um, January, so no more finger sticks. Well, what you see here is this blood sugar has a lot of variability. It's up, it's down, it's low, it's high. And this is what Rich was talking about in regards to variability. Uh, 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 and this is the risk of hypoglycemia that you see here as well. So we're going to talk a little bit about adherence. And uh, Dr. Koop said drugs don't work if you don't take them. And that's absolutely true. It's interesting that in randomized clinical trials, like all the things Rich was talking about, you usually got those patients down to, tar to target. You want a target of less than 7%, we'll get you there. Because they're in, a, they're in a kind of medical home for clinical trials. Why? Well, these, these clinical trials employ dietitians, CDEs. They have clinical research coordinators that really know diabetes. They call patients before the visit, make sure they come in. They talk to them in between visits, make sure everything's okay. All the labs are done and everything's free, and patients are given a stipend for being in the study. But when all is said and done, the A1Cs still remain high in real life. Why? because only about 29% of patients on GLP-1s maintain the use of those drugs over a year's period of time. Only about 34% of the patients keep on a DPP-4. For sulfonylureas, it's about 35%, and TZDs around the same, 35%. So if you don't take the meds, you're going to be in trouble. There's going to be a higher risk of complications, a uh, higher risk of premature death, and even sometimes withdrawal from the drugs. So. Medication non-adherence uh, really means a lot of different things. Sometimes patients are told, like with metformin, take it twice a day. Well, what does that mean? Should I take it at 8 in the morning and 8 at 8, 10 a.m.? That's twice a day. No, you have to take it with food. If you don't take it with food, you're going to get GI uh, upset, and what's going to happen then is you're going to stop taking the medicine, most likely. Uh, some people take more than they're supposed to because if the blood sugar goes up to 300, we're going to think, well, may maybe I should take another dose of this and see if that brings it down. Okay? Inappropriate supplements. Uh, the best uh, example I can give you here is if you're taking Synthroid, thyroid medicine, levothyroxine. You can't take it with calcium and iron. If you do, it won't be absorbed. But my favorite, which I will now demonstrate, is improper injection. Now, it does no good to show the patient the pen and say, let's give it a try. You have to follow up and have them show you how to do it. I learned this from my father-in-law, Rich. Uh, he uh, was on insulin as well. And I never understood why I couldn't get his A1C down below 9%. Then I saw him one day injecting. Actually, I heard it. He pretended like he was a pirate of the Caribbean. He would take the pen, start up here, kind of close his eyes, spread his legs, and we'd go, hey -oh, -oh, like that. And I, I saw it, and out of the injection site came some stuff. Some of it was clear, some of it was yellow. I don't know if it was bile. I don't know if it was the insulin. I don't know. But I said, no, that's not the way you do it. You have to put it in, 
uh, press the trigger, hold it for 10 seconds, and then you're done. So always check to see. Some people inject in the sweet spot, and they get lipohypertrophy or lipoatrophy as well. If you do not adhere to the, to the prescription, which uh, a lot of people don't, you're going to have a higher risk of mortality, higher risk of hospitalizations, higher cost for everybody. The other thing is fear of hypoglycemia. It is not fun to be hypoglycemic. I've had patients drive off freeways. I've had patients get into six accidents in one day due to hypoglycemia. Uh, fortunately, none, none have died from hypoglycemia. But when you get hypoglycemic, you're going to do a couple things. First, you're going to call the doctor. Next, you're going to use more strips. Next, you're going to reduce the amount of drugs that you're on or even stop them altogether. But this costs a lot of money, about $5,000. For the administrators in their office and in the room over here, I think you understand what that means. It's a very, very expensive problem. We have things that we can do now to mitigate this. We have continuous glucose sensors, and these sensors will alarm and let you know when you're going low. The other thing we have, as I mentioned, the freestyle um, uh, it's the Freestyle Pro, or Le Free, sorry, Freestyle Libre. It'll be out in January. So the patient wears this little disc about the size of a quarter, and all you do is scan. These things don't alarm, but they can give you trends, and they can warn you when, they, when you are going low. Oh, and the other thing is that we have new insulins, as Rich mentioned, that are, have less glycemic variability. If you have a flatter profile, you can lower the glucose levels better without going low. But if your blood sugars are up and down, like with NPH, if you lower that, you're likely to get more hypoglycemia. So what are the strategies that you have for successful diabetes management? There's just five of them. Number one, you've got to know your metabolic target as a patient. A1C fasting postprandial glucose levels. You've got to know how to achieve these metabolic targets. And that means lifestyle intervention is important. You've got to take the medicines. If you don't like the medicine, talk to us, and we'll show you how to be successful. If you don't smoke, then you can admit step four. And finally, which is, I think, one of the reasons that you're here, is to receive care from doctors and companies that are expert in managing diabetes. So what about medical homes? Do medical homes help with diabetes management? Well, this is a series of, uh, this is a study looking at uh, four different medical homes and uh, how well they manage diabetes based on NCQA guidelines. And lo and behold, there was less hospitalizations, less expenses, uh, less complications with foot and eyes. So it seems like if you put your mind to this, you can make it work and it becomes very cost effective. So I kind of mentioned the team approach to people with diabetes, but the most important part about this slide is look who's in the middle. It's not the doctor, it's not the nurse, it's not the foot doctor, it's the patient. Everybody has to work towards a common goal in educating these people. Diabetes is a very complex, comprehensive, lifelong disease. So you need a pharmacist, you need a case manager, you need a primary care doctor, uh, you need nurses and behavioralists as well. A lot of people with diabetes become distressed, not depressed, but distressed over all the things they have to do. So a team can really work in improving this. This is a collaborative process. I found the most important thing I do is write everything down. Patients are not stupid. They'll do anything they want, that you want them to do. They want you to be happy with their progress. But write it down. Have them come back and go over the plan and then revise if necessary. A few weeks ago, I had a patient that was very upset with me. He said, every time I come in, you try something else. He said, of course. If I didn't, then you wouldn't do well. So we always have to adjust therapy. If we were driving uh, to, uh, from Southern California to Las Vegas, and we just closed our eyes and held onto the wheel, we're going to go off the road really quick. So we make little adjustments in the plan and write it down once again. There's uh, medical homes have this uh, pre-visit planning, which is really important. They did those in the studies that I showed you before with the four medical homes. They would call the patient. They would check in with them periodically. They advised them to bring the meters and some other logs as far as exercise and food. Uh, and also, very important, bring in your medicines with you so that we can make sure that there's nothing added, nothing that we don't know about. And bring your questions as well. The most important thing in a visit, two things. You've got to look at that meter. You've got to download the meter because the patient is pricking themselves multiple times a day and they want to see what you think of their effort. And then 
the other thing is, besides praising them for the effort, is actually physically examining them. It's really important to touch the patient. That's what we are. We're clinicians. We're physicians. We touch people. So touch them. And then there's a bond that goes through you that the patient says, you know, he cares. Uh, with the visit afterwards, keep it as simple as possible. Review the medications. I think uh, that the most important thing with this concept is explain the risks and benefits of all the meds that you, that you uh, use, and also explain to the patient at what point they should see some improvement. If they're checking their blood sugar, fasting in the morning, say, if they're on a GLP-1, you might see some improvement pretty quick maybe within the first week. With an SGL2, it might be right away. So you'll see a, a drop from 160 to 120 with an SGLT2, and the patient will say, well, now I know why I'm t- checking. So that's always a good thing as well. This is a translate uh, trial. This is uh, uh, a study based out of Minnesota where they took 24 primary care practices and essentially made them into many medical homes. And they said, these are what you're going to be doing. You're going to call patients in advance. You're going to have a doctor in charge of you. Uh, you're going to have labs that are reviewed on a weekly and monthly basis. If there's a high lab value, somebody's going to call you, and we're going to keep a very, very close eye on you for a year. And they did this in comparison to a standard of care where they said, you're on a study, just do what you're normally doing. So it turns out that with this translate study, what you're going to find is a 30% reduction in uh, many of the things that you look at at NCQA, including improved foot exams, include eye, uh, improved eye exams as well. But there is also, if you add it all up, there's a 52% reduction in cardiovascular risk in over 60,000 patients that participated. Pretty impressive what medical homes can do. And this is the diabetes recognition program, which you're familiar with. You want to get the A1C down, the blood pressure, and so forth. If you do that, everybody wins. That having been said, uh, I want to thank you for your time. We have about five minutes for any questions that you have. If you want to, yes, uh, go up to the micro- microphone, which is right over there. You mentioned diabetes distress. I wanted to know if you were using the DDS-17 and how you were using that. Yeah, so uh, patients that have diabetes are not always depressed, but they're stressed out about having the disease itself. So there's a, a couple of scales you could use. The, the diabetes distress scale, DSS, uh, we use it, it, there's a two-question uh, I can't remember the exact questions, but you ask these two questions, if they're both positive, you go on to the larger scale. But it's a good thing to do because when you find somebody that has diabetes distress, you have to work with them. You negotiate. Say, what are you willing to do? Can you check your blood sugar? First of all, what are you willing to do? And they say, well, I'll, I'll, all right, I'll check my blood sugar. Can you do it like once a day for the next uh, seven days and then take the next three weeks off? Yeah. And then after that, they come back and negotiate more. Can you take one injection of insulin a day? Yeah, I can do that. So you, you, you fix it that way. And then uh, sort of a corollary to that, if you do identify patients who are depressed, you have to treat the depression first yeah. because they're not going to engage in sort of the self-care behaviors necessary for good diabetes control. So take the primary uh, issue and fix that first. Absolutely. Well, thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, we'll be around for just a couple of minutes if you have anything else.